Jim's scripture reading just oozed in meat qualities. That's uh, quite something to think about. I've thought all week about what I preached about last week, and the idea of being meek is just so foreign to us. It just goes against our human nature. It goes against how the world tells us we're successful. J. Vernon McGee writes this. He says, how do you become meek? Our Lord was meek and lowly, and he will inherit all things. We are the heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are told that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, and meekness. Only the Spirit of God can break you and make you meek. If you could produce meekness by your own effort, you would be proud of yourself, wouldn't you? And out goes your meekness. Meekness is not produced by self-effort, but by spirit effort. Only the Holy Spirit can produce meekness in the heart of a yielded Christian. The Christian who has learned the secret of producing fruit by the Holy Spirit can turn here to the Beatitudes and read, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth and see that the rewards of meekness are still in the future. Paul asked the Corinthian believers, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? The Beatitudes' present goals with which the child of God wants to realize in his own life, but he can't do it on his own. You may have heard of the preacher who had a message entitled, Meekness and How I Attained It. He said that he hadn't delivered the message yet, but as soon as he got an audience big enough, he was going to give it. Well, I have a notion that he has long since lost his meekness. Meekness can only be a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it is a spiritual quality. Meekness, as we talked about last week, is the very essence of Jesus Christ. It's it's a heart quality. It's a work done on us through our regeneration, that act of salvation that, that Jim read about, the, the baptism, the resurrection through Christ that we experience. We're, we're made a new creature. And then the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. That, that's how meekness is achieved. Now does that mean that we can't possibly have any understanding of what meekness looks like and, and what our responsibility is to living out Meek lives? No, we understand what that is. It's just the idea of knowing that as human beings, as fallible human beings, we can't do it on our own. Meekness is an expression to God, and it's an expression to other human beings. We are transformed by God into being meek creatures. And we learn how to be meek with each other. And it comes with practice. It's not something that comes natural. It has to be delivered on our end. Uh, You know, you would think softball weekend after softball weekend, I'd start to get this, right? But there I was arguing with my wife. And I finally said, you know, I don't know why it is that I just have to be right with you. And I'm really sorry. I need to quit that. It's a bad habit. You know, and that's part of the problem with meekness. We want to be right. We want to be right. But there are three ways of expressing meekness, and we talked about that. It starts first in our hearts with our attitude. With our attitude. Do we desire to be meek? It's a motive thing. I mean, we have to want it. We have to want to be meek. It's also expressed in our words and our actions. Again, with all the rest of the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed is the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. A specific character quality or a specific type of person receiving a specific blessing. And isn't it interesting 
that those who the world would consider weak are the ones that will inherit the earth. Tim Bourgeois says that it wouldn't be taking our scripture out of context to say that the meek and only the meek will inherit the earth. That is scary, folks. The meek and only the meek will inherit the earth. And that is a huge promise. It's a promise for a certain hope, a specific hope for an awesome future. One filled with more joy then we know how to define joy now. It's inexpressible as we know joy. It's something that isn't even understood yet. It's going to be so great. And you know, there are so many people, I don't have to tell you this, that are living their lives without any kind of hope for the future. They just live in the now. And the now is a very lost feeling because we can't even, what? Determine the color of the hair of our head, right? I wish my beard was going great now. Can I do anything about it? Well, I might be able to get some stuff from Linda. But that's, you know, not me. This promise, this promise of inheriting the earth has a present life-forming influence on our lives, but yet is it, a, it is a promise to be fulfilled in the future. Now, we've talked about what is me. But what about the second part of this verse, this inheritance? We all have an idea, I think, of what inheritance means. Everybody has heard of a will. Everybody has heard of inheritance in a legal sense. It's, it's a usually binding. But inheritance is primarily understood in a family context. Okay? And specifically, what part of a family context are we talking about when we talk about inheritance? Anybody have any ideas? What are we talking about here? Talking about money. It is family, but we're talking about family wealth. Talking about, we're talking about money here. We're talking about tangible things, family wealth, finances. And, and an inheritance is a legal promise of future possession rights. Take your Bibles and turn back to Genesis 13. I'll show you an example of how this works out for the meek. Y'all are familiar with Father Abraham, who was once Abram when God called him. And God made a great covenant with Abraham. He told him to go and he would make him father of many, many nations. So in verse 1 of chapter 13, we see that Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him, and Lot is his nephew, and to the Negev. Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the first place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord, and Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife, a conflict, a problem, a fight, between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. And Abram said to Lot, this is why God chooses people, because of what he sees in them. And get this. Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen, or family. Let's not let there be anything between us. 
Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abram was the one with whom God had made the promise, the covenant. Lot was riding Abram's coattails. He invited him along. Abram could have said, listen, you take that little hill over there, the rest is mine. I'm God's man. I'm the one with whom the covenant's made. But he didn't do that. He said, let's not have any strife between us. You pick. And whatever you pick, I'll take the other. Your choice. You go first. That is meekness. That is a lowly and contrite heart. Didn't work out so well for Lot because he pitched his tent too near to Sodom. And that was a sinful city. We've got to watch where we pitch our tent, folks. Lot was in blessing with God among Abraham and he took that land, that rich, fertile land along the Jordan. And he pitched his tent too close to Sodom. But the point is that the godly perspective on inheritance is not what can I get? There's too many people in this world waiting for their great aunt to kick the bucket, right? They're just, they're just salivating at the idea of this windfall of money that's coming. But it's not about what will I get, but what will I leave? That's the point. What can I give? Not what will I get? The hope of family wealth is to pass it on to the next generation, hopefully making it better for them. That's the idea that is behind this inheritance. The purpose of the inheritance is for the kingdom of earth. The kingdom of earth. We can't wrap our minds around that, but we will in a minute. See, there's going to be a specific legal transfer of wealth at a very specific time in the future. Ask yourself this question. What, what does God presently possess that He could pass on to His family? Everything. Everything. Everything is God's. This inheritance is for family. Who are God's family? The meek and the meek alone. We really, really need to understand whether we're among the meek or not. The meek, and it follows a pattern. The poor in spirit, that brokenness causes to mourn. The meek, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's a pattern over and over and over. We'll see how this plays out as we continue to study. But God's promise is the earth. The entire earth. The land. In the Old Testament in the Hebrew, when you read the land, it's the same word for earth. God promises the meek, His family, the entire earth. And I agree with Mr. Bourgeois when he says the church has not done a good job of helping people understand what it is that we're going to inherit. What's at stake? What's at play? I mean, we may feel comfortable, we may not, with what we have, but there is so much more coming for those that are meek. I asked you two weeks ago to check out Psalm 37. So go ahead and turn back there. Because Jesus had, well, I shouldn't say had to, but Jesus must have had Psalm 37 in his mind when he said on the Sermon of the Mount that the meek would inherit the earth. Psalm 37. We're going to read some specific verses. This psalm 
addresses every believer. Every single one of us. We talked last week about the world and how they view possessions and success. We said that the world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. They want what's yours. Right? Psalm 37, starting in verse 7. Be still on the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourselves over the one who prospers in His way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourselves, it only tends to evil, for the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there, the wicked but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Meekness, gentleness, that lifestyle that we strive to, even in this lifetime, if Jesus tarries and we die, we will experience the beginning of the inheritance, which is abundant peace, everlasting joy, real stuff, not false, in the now happiness but happiness that will consume us and be part of our life. Skip on down to 18, verse 18. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. That's the meek. For they are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. Skip to 22. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit to the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Verse 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The righteous are the meek. Verse 34. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land you will look on when the wicked are cut off. This will no longer be about the strong surviving in the future when the Lord comes. It's as if Jesus stood up on that mount in front of all of those descendants of Abraham who had been oppressed by the Romans for years now. Not so long ago in their history, they had been an independent nation through a bloody time period called the Maccabean Revolt. And Israel became their own nation. But then a man named Pompey from Rome sold them out. And they became under the jurisdiction of the Romans. And they had been ruled by the Herodians, as we've talked about, that family that weren't even Jews, but Idumeans. They'd been ruled by governors such as Pontius Pilate. And they, they ruled harshly, tyrannically, with the sword. And Jesus gets up to give the Sermon on the Mount. Many people after the feeding of the 5,000, after the miracles He's performed, are thinking, this is the guy. This is the Messiah. The zealots are thinking, here's the one who's going to mount the white horse, the black horse, the war horse, and with one broad stroke of his sword, he's going to wipe out the Romans. The Pharisees are thinking, this guy's going to do a great miracle and restore the nation of Israel. And Jesus gets up and says, blessed are the meek. And they're like, What? We're already meek. No, they're not. They're proud. They're arrogant. They're boastful. Jesus' promise to them is completely opposite of what they have in mind. He said, no, it's not you that are important in the temple. It's not you that have any wealth in Israel. 
It's the sinners. It's the drug addicts. It's the prostitutes. It's the tax collectors who have no hope, who have no life, who are so down that all they can do is look up and see me. But you have elevated yourself so high that all you can do is fall and see nothing. Psalm 37, what we read, is a full version of what Jesus promises when He says, the meek will inherit the earth. See this land that the psalm talks about in the time of David, David writing this psalm, was the land of Canaan, the land of Palestine, okay, where Abram dwelt. Lot went to the other side where it was fertile. Abram took the land of Canaan. That was the promised land. That's where Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land. And that was at that time the described physical boundary, the kingdom of God that little strip of Palestine. But that wasn't what God has in mind for us to understand when He talks about inheriting the earth. See, Jesus takes this strip of land that the Israelites have in their mind that was once theirs and has been taken by Rome, and Jesus says, I'm not talking about this little bitty narrow focus. I'm talking about the whole earth. And He does this purposefully. He wants them to understand that what they think they have or have been taken away is so narrow compared to what he's offering and what he says that this character quality will promise, what blessing will come. The kingdom of heaven, perfectly ruled by God, is coming down in some way through King Jesus and everything will start changing like a seed producing and reproducing fruit till all the earth is infiltrated, transformed, and changed. We're part of that right now. When, when John the Baptist went to prison and Jesus started his ministry, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Folks, that's been over 2,000 years ago. Look at what happened with those 12 trees that Jesus planted in Jerusalem. Those disciples. How many times have we talked about how many different denominations there are just in the United States? Well, it was a, it was a crazy number. What was it, like 60,000 or something like that? I don't remember. Maybe it was 12,000. That's just in the United States. Yeah, they're denominations, but they're denominations of Jesus Christ. Okay? Yeah, we're not unified like we should be, but see what happened with 12 men? The seed just started exploding and reproducing all over the world. Christianity has exploded all over the world. We're part of the kingdom of heaven now. It's not fully realized. Why isn't it? Because the Great Commission has not been fulfilled. That's why we're still here. That's why Jesus has tarried. Inheritance, inheritance, true inheritance of this promise for the meek points to the fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven. Heaven coming down to earth. The transfer is upon His return. That legal promise is going to be given to all of the Christian followers. Israel Palestine, that little strip, that was just the beginning point. Look back to Genesis. Let's go clear back to chapter 1. Because this is how God has always intended it. Genesis chapter 1. Starting in verse 26. very important word that we should always remember when we read this section of Scripture. It's us. Then God said, let us make man. The triune God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion. That means to rule 
over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The whole earth is what God had in mind. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue it. Take control over it. It's yours. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. Then the hiccup came. Everybody remember the hiccup? Adam, Adam was to rule. He was to protect the garden. Men, we're still to protect the garden. Do you get that? That's always been our charge from God, our command. We're to protect the garden. The full plan, obviously, was the whole earth. We don't know for sure where the Garden of Eden was. Some scholars think portion in North Africa, below Mesopotamia. I don't know. It's, it's not there anymore. We had a flood, if anybody wants to know why. It's not there anymore, okay? But that garden was where God started it. But his intention was for Adam and Eve and their, <laughs> and their descendants to rule over all the earth over all the things. However, the fall of man, the issue of sin came into play. And the plan extended, as Paul says, to the second Adam, Jesus. The last Adam, Jesus. And I want to tell you, that was God's plan all along. Don't think for a minute that God was caught off guard by Adam stub stubbing his toe. God anticipates everything. He is an omniscient God. Adam was never, ever going to be capable of keeping God's plan. It wasn't going to happen. He made Adam in his image. Just like we are made in God's image. But God gave Adam free will, and he gave us free will. And when we have free will, we choose us, not God. Too many times, Adam was never going to be able to accomplish God's plan. God told him, go into all the world. You see, the Great Commission, the Great Commission is a mission of peace. Blessed are the meek. They're going to be peacemakers too. They understand what peace is. Look, if you're already down... If you already realize that you are completely dependent on God, then you have nowhere else to fall down. You're already there. So if you live your life meekly, totally dependent on the blessings of God, and extending that to your fellow citizens, your fellow human beings, you're going to understand what it is to be meek. This is... This great commission that Jesus gave us, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. It's a transformation of the world spiritually from the inside out. Jesus' message has never been a message of the sword. It's been a message of love and peace. Go into the world, share the good news. Don't cut off their heads. Share the good news. It's a message of peace. Jesus is talking to the meek about the big picture at hand in inheriting the earth and how it should be accomplished. You see, He really did die on the cross. We always need to remember that. 
Jesus really did die on the cross. And he really did rise from the grave. Why is that important? Because he was the meekest man that ever lived. And the strongest at the same time. Jesus had anger. It was righteous anger. He's falsely accused. He's standing on trial. And he never defended himself. But when the money changers were offending God, that's a whole different story. Then the anger came. He'll go to the cross for God and for us, but he won't even defend himself when he's falsely accused and beaten and scourged and spit upon and mocked. Second Peter 3.10 is a description of the certainty of Jesus' return. If you want to turn there, we're going to start in verse 8. This is what Peter writes in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, starting in verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. That's why in the psalm, the psalmist kept saying, be patient and wait on the Lord. Be patient and wait on the Lord. He doesn't move like we move. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should, repeat, should attain and reach repentance. God doesn't want anyone to go unsaved. That's why we've been given the mission we've been given. But the day of the Lord, and it's coming, will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with the roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. A new heaven. The old heaven, the old earth, exposed, dissolved, burned up. What sort of people should we be knowing this? Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening? I will hasten to Him. Hastening the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolve and the heavenly bodies will melt away as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake because you will be filled. You will be filled. The new renewal that we're going to have in the new heaven and the new earth will be better than the first creation. I don't know how that's possible, but that's what this says. A new heaven, a new earth where righteousness dwells. There will be a tangible, physical Heaven and earth, but completely different. Does anyone know the, the main reason it's going to be completely different? Because righteousness will dwell here. There will be no evil in the world any longer. There will be no sin. There will be no sorrow. There will be no shame. God will dwell with us. That's what it means where righteousness will dwell. Folks, God dwells in our hearts, but physically, tangibly, as a being, God has not existed among us since the Shekinah glory left the temple long before Jesus came. God actually dwelled with man at one time, remember? He led them out of Egypt. Revelation 21 talks more about this new heaven and new earth. Verse 1, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. 
The former things have passed away. There's a new heaven and a new earth. There are two Greek words for new. One of them talks about time or origin as if something is brand new. Brand new. The second is new in quality. New in quality. It's the exact same new heaven, new earth, but it's better. Tangible heaven, tangible earth, but it's new and better in a new quality. And the fulfillment of this promise of inheritance with the new heaven and the new earth is fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. But we can experience this promise in measure now. We can experience this promise of peace and righteousness now. And it's kind of a down payment. What happened to you when you died to yourself and you rose in Christ? What happened to you? You died and you became a new creature. New in quality. New in quality. Yeah, the flesh was the same, but you're brand new in quality. You no longer have strikes against you. It's like going up. <laughs> it's like going up against a pitcher and there are no strikes. All you get to do is hit the ball. It's home run every time. No strikes against you ever. They've all been taken away. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. New in quality. The new spirit we have is that seed that's planted in our hearts. And that's the down payment on this inheritance. How many of you, and I know all of you probably have, how many of you have been at some point in your life so miserable, you never ever thought you could be happy again? Sorrow, hurt, shame, whatever, suffering. You've been clear down here and thought you could never be happy again. Somewhere in all that loneliness and heartache, we remember that we have value. We have value because of who it is that's within us. And we always have that. No one can take that away from us. Regardless how far we think we have fallen from God's grace, we can't outgive God. Can't do it. Look at the prodigal son. We've talked about that story. I beat you over the head with it. But the kid wanted his inheritance first. That's just okay. Father says, go ahead. And, and, when, he, and when he had just blown it all, did, did the father lord it over his head? No. He was just glad to have him back. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and the Corinthian church was full of problems. Problems. But no different than today. Okay? Do not deceive yourselves. Now I want you to think about this, and I want you to think how our restoration movement has been defined on the purpose of unity in the church and the purpose of getting back to apostolic teaching and I want you to think just in our lifetime how far this thing has gone how divisive ecclesia has become do not deceive you yourselves if any of you think you're wise by the standard of this age you should become fools so that you may become wise for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, who is Peter, 
or the word of life, or death, or the present and the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. Basically, he's saying, I don't care what your church leaders are saying. You don't follow them. You follow Christ, who is a direct heir of the inheritance of God, and we are co-heirs because of that. They were fighting over, you know, this group over here, well, they had received instruction from Peter. So they were more holy than this group over here because they had received instruction from Apollos. And he was a great evangelist. And this group back there, they were more holy and righteous than the other two groups because they had received their teaching from Paul. And Paul says, this is stupid. You're all under the authority of Jesus Christ. Quit it. Don't deceive yourselves. You're not wise by the standards of this age. They had fighting factions. But the big picture of this is in verse 21. Everything is ours. Ecclesia, everything is yours. Those that belong to Christ are co-heirs. Denomination, non-denomination, those that belong to Christ are co-heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ, and Christ has ownership over everything. We don't own anything. It's all Christ. And the only reason we're in the will is because of the blood He has shed. Nothing that we have done, nothing that we have learned or put into practice in our works or our words, nothing we can do will save ourselves except to fall under the subjection and the authority of Jesus Christ. Just a decision. Just a decision. Now, I know all of you, I'm confident, all of you have already made that decision. So those, there's no point, really, in offering an invitation to people that have already experienced the decision. And have already experienced the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what I want to invite you to is to realize that people don't understand inheritance like we do now. And we have to become this to help them understand. If we're prideful, boastful, harsh, coarse, they'll never understand the Christian perspective of inheritance that only comes through Jesus Christ. They will continue to put their trust and their faith in their pocketbook. And we all know that we are just a disaster away from having nothing. The hand of God can wipe out everything we own like this. Not because he's vengeful or has some grievance against us. Because we'll have an opportunity to give him glory through our suffering. It is tough to be a follower of Christ. But that's what we are. I want to invite you to experience meekness on a daily basis this week. My challenge to you is, and it's my own because I didn't do it this week. I'm going to do it this week though. Every morning, first of all, you're going to need to get three note cards. I'm going to put one in your bathroom on your mirror, you put one on your nightstand, you put one in your car. And all you need to say is something along the lines of Jesus help me be meek. And let the Holy Spirit do His work. Just give Him a chance to remind you. Just give Him a chance to encourage you as you see that reminder. Try it. See what happens. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, It'll save somebody from getting tongue lashed by you. You know? And that can make the whole difference in someone's life. We, we never know how harsh and sharp our words cut other people's heart. We don't intend to hurt people, but it happens. So I, I, I invite you to experience meekness this week. Even if it's just a little bit. Try it out. And I know many of you are already meek. I'm not insulting you. Extend it. 
See if you can make it more like Jesus' definition of meekness. Just because you're quiet and don't say a lot doesn't mean that you're necessarily meek. It's what's in here, okay? Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful this morning for Your Word. I'm grateful, God, that You used the Holy Spirit to guide my thoughts as I'm preaching. God, we're all in the same boat, living in a world that teaches us to be selfish and self-centered. But God, we're here this morning because we love your son, we love you. We realize that there is so much more at stake than just the lives that we're living in the here and now. That you have a special purpose for each one of us. And we're here this morning, God, to, to pay reverence to you and hopefully understand a little bit more about that purpose. God, I just ask that you would bless these folks and their families their homes, their jobs. Father, bless them with only the joy that you can give. Help us to receive that in a manner that's worthy and pleasing to you. Help us to open up our hearts so that we might expose ourselves to that, that meek quality that you desire for each one of us. God, we, need to, we all need to humble ourselves. We all know that. We ask for your forgiveness when we've been prideful and arrogant, boastful, harsh. Father, may, may we choose words this week that are loving and caring, words that restore people, that encourage people. And, and Father, may we do that for ourselves. We know we're not perfect, but we're, we, are, we are saved. We, we have this inheritance coming. Help us focus upon that, God. Not worry so much about covering our bases now because you have all that covered. You clothe us. You feed us. You provide for our families in every single way. Even if we don't think we have much, we have all we need. God, may we be generous this week with all that we have, whether it be our time, our spirituality, our resources, but most certainly may we be generous with the gospel. Father, just thank you for this day. We, we pray, Father, a blessing on Chloe this week. I uh, just ask, Father, that uh, you would use her in a mighty way as she goes and, and helps teach uh, the littler ones at camp. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would just bless everything that goes on at IMO, that you would uh, give them good weather for the rest of camp season, and that many, many of those young minds and young hearts will be transformed to know a loving relationship with your son. Father, thank you so much for this day and this time, the freedom that we have to gather without fear of persecution so that we might be an encouragement to one another and that we might worship you giving you all the praise, glory, and honor that you're due. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.